All right, I got John Hallett here today. He came all the way from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yep. And why did you come down here, John? <laughs> oh, we've been coming here to ride horses in the desert for uh, many, many years. So. Really? What's the connection for that? Uh, well, I, I was forced to come when I got married. Uh, my in-laws uh, had been coming here for a long time. I and, got it. Uh, coming to the White Stallion Ranch. Yeah. And um, uh, so I say forced. It's uh, in jest. Uh, yeah, it's no. a beautiful place to come. And, and so the first year I came was 1990 and pretty much every year since. That's a long time, so, actually. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. like thirty years, thirty-two yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. So, so every year you'll come only on Thanksgiving, kind of time. Right? No, or? we. Um, the first time I came was uh, over the New Year's holiday, mm. and then we shifted to February because mm. my mother-in-law is a silversmith, so she wanted to come for Gem Show. Mm, yeah, got it. Uh, and then as the kids got older into high school, we switched to Thanksgiving, high right. school and college, because right. it was easier to get down here. Yeah, and are they still in high school and college? No, they're both they're both done. So ah. now it's my turn to go back. Got Got it. So that's one of the reasons we're having John on today is so John reached out to me and he's a small vet, small animal vet that he's been doing for 30 plus years. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But he has uh, made a change. He always loved art. We're going to find out about it. I don't know the whole backstory, but it sounded pretty interesting. And now he's in a master's of fine arts. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so he's going to become an artist. And one of the things he had contacted me about was he goes, OK, I have some questions about, you know, what do I do? How do I do this? You know, some just general questions that smart people ask before they, you know, finish their master's. So they have at least a sense of maybe a roadmap. And I said to John, I said, well, it's an interesting story you have. First of all, <laughs> let's investigate the story. And then at the end part of the podcast, you can ask me the questions that you want to ask me. You know, okay. and I'll give you my input to what I think, you know, sure. good, bad or indifferent. And then maybe other people who are listening to this podcast, it might be in the same boat instead of having to show up and get an appointment to come see me to ask those questions. They can go and listen to John's, uh, you know, podcast and my podcast and hopefully we'll have answered some of the questions. So Wonderful. Yeah. And I've never done that before. I've never offered to do that before, but it just seemed like it would be a kind of a cool thing to do and a different kind of a, a concept and hopefully help more people. Good, and, good. And especially you. Right. Because <laughs> right, that's really right. who, all you care about <laughs> anyway, you know, is, is your own world. So tell me, did you grow up in Minnesota? No, no. Uh, we moved around a lot. I was born in Rhode Island. Then we lived in Southern Florida for a while. And then um, middle school on was in Madison, Wisconsin. And was uh, your were your parents in the military or no, just um, just said I don't like Rhode Island I'm going to Florida I'm going here in Rhode Island or you know yeah my parents were in graduate school in Rhode Island and then my dad got a job in Florida uh-huh and what did he um, do he was working on a PhD in chemical oceanography so he was what a was water, it chemical what chemical oceanography oh, oceanography so and then he was a water chemist in Florida and yeah. we didn't like southern florida so then it was mom's turn she has a had a master's in um child development was mm. registered nurse and and so she took a job in wisconsin mm. they liked the idea of us living in a college town because we'd be more likely to get swallowed up by the college and yeah was well, that true <laughs> go yeah absolutely yeah my brother and i both uh went to uw madison and we were both on the rowing team there and yeah so so you look at yourself as somebody a Wisconsin, Wisconsinite? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. that's where you, did you go to like junior high, high school there? Yeah. And yeah. so when you were a kid in your junior high, or maybe even a little bit before that, were you doing art? Were you interested in art at that time? Uh, you know, I would say more craft. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was very good at exposing us to different things like woodworking and making things. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until high school that I really got into art. So I had one year of drawing and design and then got into an art metal uh, program for three years. So I was making jewelry and, and lost mm. wax casting. And I always wanted- In high school? In high school, yeah. God. Madison, Wisconsin. How wonderful is that? Yeah. And then I had one year of sculpture and ceramics. Um, so yeah, my senior year In was, high school, sculptures in, yeah. and ceramics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Senior year it was two art classes, two science classes, and typing, and that was it. Wow! So <laughs> it's just so awesome to be able to have that. We had no art classes at all. Really? Yeah, basically nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and you had metal shop, mm -hmm. jewelry production, sculpture, and so your family history, as I understand it, your grandfather was. My great great grandfather was three greats, two greats, two greats. Yeah, uh, was uh, the founder of Hallett Iron Works in Chicago, 
And, uh, and then my great grandfather took it over, um, until that closed down during the depression. Um, but they did a lot of architectural details in cast iron and a lot of, um, uh, equipment for, um, telephone poles and, and mm-hmm. during the REA. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I kind of appropriated the name since the business wasn't operational anymore when mm-hmm. I started getting into, um, casting bronze and cast iron and, um, then I, I just adopted the name and, and some relatives sent me letterhead and catalogs from yeah. the original company, which is pretty cool. And the original company, we're talking like turn of the century or even a little before then? A little before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In Chicago. Yeah. yeah. And so your great grandfather, he was a metal smith. Would that be the proper term versus calling him an artist or a bronze artist? Yeah. Or I would did say he do foundry, both? foundryman. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and businessman. Yeah, and so he did it, and his son did it. Right. Your father's grandfather, yes. right? And um, and then it closed because of the depression. So like it was open for forty years basically, and then the depression put him out of work. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. know what happened to your grandfather after that? Um, I think um, I think he went on um, into education and mm-hmm. and ran a school and um. Uh, I don't have a lot of details, but I need I need to press my dad for more information yeah, you about should. that. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. And and he was your dad grew up in Chicago? Oh, they moved around a lot. Um my my grandfather was a Methodist minister. Ah, and so okay, there you go. they like to move around a lot. And he but your grandfather, the Methodist minister, was the one that worked in the foundry as well? He he did as as a young man. Yeah. Um, but his father is the one that uh, yeah, he was, the, was the second generation. Yeah. So and so Going backwards a little bit, so you're in high school, you have all these classes in art, metalsmith, and you were, I assume, aware of your background, your family history when you were doing yeah, all this? Yeah, yeah, no, I, or a little you, bit, or a I, little the bit. reason I'm asking, or just did it come natural? You're like, I seem to like to work in metal for some yeah, reason. Yeah, that's more it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I, I, um, when I was in drawing design, I, I, uh, I found out there was this art metal class that's for juniors and seniors. Mm-hmm. And, my teacher asked me what I was going to do my sophomore year. And I said, well, I'm not going to take art because I really want to do this class, but it's junior, senior level. And so he marched me upstairs, introduced me to the teacher. And Mm -hmm. so that's how I got three years of it. And I always wanted to cast larger things. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't until much later that I I took some workshops and, and um, started getting more into that. Mm -hmm. So when you left high school, what were you thinking you were going into or did you know? Well, it was a real struggle, art or science. Right. Yeah, it was those two things, and I loved animals, and um, so I uh, I decided I could always do art on the side. Mm. And was that true? Uh, yeah, I pretty much have. Okay, that's I pretty good. Pretty much have, um, and I would say the the veterinary practice really informs my art practice uh, with the anatomy knowledge and, oh, and sure. sculpting animals and. Um, so it was, it was a big decision between art or science yeah. and I went the science route and, um, was that helped along by your parents or siblings that said, yeah, don't do the art thing. Mm, you know, my dad didn't really say do or don't. He, mm-hmm. he asked questions mm-hmm. <laughs> and He's a scientist himself, right? Right. Right. P- did he had a PhD in he almost, yeah. So almost, but, but he, he was high level for yeah. oceanography chemistry, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so he's saying, what was he saying to you? Well, he's saying it's important to have an avocation. Yeah. (laughs) uh, Something that you enjoy doing. And and I think I was a little worried about trying to make a a living with art. I was afraid it would kind of stymie my creativity. And um, so that's... uh, And and I figured I could still work with my hands being a veterinarian. Right. And that's true. I focused a lot on surgery. Uh, over the years and so it's just a different form of art i think yeah were you married at that time or when you were making these decisions no no i met my wife in veterinary school and we okay. married just after right. that school so totally made the right call then yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> so you go to college and you start out as a biology major or a biology with a minor in art kind of thing? animal science yeah animal science and i stayed away from art classes because i was afraid I would put all my energy into the art because uh-huh. that's, I, I knew, you know, it's like an addiction and I, I knew um, it would, it would really be a struggle. So I really focused on the struggle that you might want to go into art and 
that I might put more time stuff. into the art yeah. class and less into the animal science stuff. Yeah. And and I mean to get into vet school, yeah, pretty high grades are needed. Right. And so um, one, I did one summer class in uh, uh, ceramics. Got back into wheel throwing and mm -hmm. and um, and then when I met when I met Heidi in veterinary school, who's my wife. Um, her mom is a silversmith, and so I I got to use her shop, and I got back into making jewelry, and so that was fun. Was there any time during that time frame? It really sounds like it's a big struggle for you, really, almost like stay away from art because I, that's really where my heart wants to be, <laughs> and I'm afraid if I just even touch it like a drug, I'm I'm all in. So is that true? Is that a kind of a a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, but you said, no, I got to do this other thing because I like it and I know I can make a living, a good living. Right. And I can still make my art. Yes. Okay. And I love I love being a veterinarian. I mean, that was clearly a, a correct choice. But, um, I mean, fast forward to now, I just feel such a strong pull back to the art. Yeah. Well, it's probably always been there. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you just suppressed it, quite frankly. Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, in vet school, I was making jewelry for professors and they'd give me photos of their favorite pet and yeah and i'd, I'd make pins or earrings and <laughs> supplement my my meager income with, yeah. with some of that and so you would continue and you at that point you were just making pretty much jewelry yeah. and, and was that because your wife's mom had the silversmithing tools and different things yeah yeah i i would say and then you know i could i could do you know i could cut out pieces and do soldering in my apartment right and um, it was pretty easy to do. I wasn't doing any casting at that point. So. Yeah. And so you got through vet school, right? And do you make, because I don't really know about vet school. Do you have to make a decision when you go into vet school, if you're going to go big animal, small animal, or are all vet schools the same? You kind of learn it all. You learn it all. They're, they're starting to track earlier now. Um, but uh, we had to learn everything. And the, the board exams cover all species from mm. you know fish to cows mm -hmm. and, and everything in between so mm. um i originally thought i wanted to go into mixed practice large and small animal and mm. that kind of kept my interest in all the the large animal classes and then as i got closer to graduation i i found i really liked working with dogs and cats and so that's where i ended up and that's more of a decision of i like these animals they're more interesting to work with or is that also a financial thing where you go eh, this is also pays better. I mean, like in medicine, we might go, well, dermatology or plastics or whatever. Those <laughs> things just pay a lot more than an internist, you know, and those are, you know, components that people will go, well, I want to go into this because of that, or my hours are better because of this. Um, I would, uh, for me, it wasn't a financial decision. It was, it was more, um, I would say, cultural familiarity, mm. uh, not growing up on a, on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. Mm, yeah. Um, I also liked more uh, the individual medicine approach rather than herd medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I had really strong bonds with um, pets as, as a kid and mm. with dogs and cats and we raised birds. And, mm. and so I really felt drawn uh, towards the small animal side and very comfortable in that area. Yeah. Yeah. I could see doing it. That'd be fun. Mm -hmm. personally i probably could have easily done it yeah, <laughs> i yeah. love animals yeah i would have been a herpetologist vet though yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you do much with snakes lizards turtles very things? little i i had a two-week uh externship actually it was a month at the animal medical center in new york city which is uh, uh it was like a an eight-story animal hospital mm -hmm. in manhattan mm -hmm. and so we saw everything yeah i'm sure um and so that was a lot of birds but also a lot of snakes and turtles and, right. and things like that so yeah but by the time you get out, you go, okay, I know what I want to do. And then what? Do you go and find a place to set up business? Um, I, actually, so in in the veterinary field, um, at the time, there were only about um, enough residency spots, internship and residency spots for about 5% of the graduates. Mm. And so what takes the place of that is working for another veterinarian. I see, like an internship and, kind of a thing. Yeah, well, it's full employment, but you know, if you get in with a multi-doctor hospital, you learn a lot. And oh yeah, I'm so sure. I I worked in uh, New England for a few years, and then mm -hmm. we missed the Midwest, so we moved back to Wisconsin, and then eventually opened our own practice. And your wife was doing the same thing, same time. Yes, and same type of thing, small animal. Small animal. Yeah. Yep. Did yep. she know of your love for? I'm sure she must have for working in metal and silversmith and art and all that. 
Definitely. Her brothers gave her a hard time when they heard that I, that I made jewelry. Because her mom was <laughs> yeah, a jeweler? Yeah, They're like, oh, mom's going to love him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she did, too. Yeah. I'm sure it was a very nice fit. Yeah. How about her Her mom? Did she go, maybe you want to go and do this instead of your veterinarian? No, no. no she liked the fact that her daughter had a secure yeah, husband. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, probably I so. I think so. Yeah. So you do the veterinarian thing, you fi and you finally end up, in Minneapolis, right? No, uh, in southeastern Wisconsin. Is where you went. Okay. Yeah, that's where our practice is. So. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how long did you practice there for? Uh, let's see. We moved there in 93. So, um, and in 90, uh, 98, we built uh, our animal hospital, mm -hmm. um, designed and built it, worked with an architect. And, mm -hmm. and so- Any um, art in it that you did? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll Absolutely. Let's, let's hear the, about that. What'd you put in there? The whole design process, I think, was a big art project. Yeah. You know, designing a beautiful building that would be welcoming and right. um, not necessarily look, it doesn't look medical. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, Heidi's got paint. My wife's an oil painter as well. And was so, she an oil painter before she went into veterinarian? No. Yeah. No, so she, she picked it up. Later. At, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she's got paintings there. I've got sculptures there. Um, some of my favorite patients I've sculpted and cast in bronze. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, so when you're working as a, during this process of being a veterinarian and you've did it for 30 years, 30, 32, 32 years in that process, were you making art all the way along or did it kind of come and go cyclically? Yeah, it would come and go depending on, you know, life's challenges with right. uh, Kids and new stuff. children and yeah. yeah, things like that. But you know, I was scout master for a number of years for my, my boys um, scout troop. And then when I, once they were graduated, eventually I stuck around for a little while and then I, and then I um, stepped back from scouting and, and then it was time uh, for me to really get back into the arts. Mm -hmm. so. And what kind of things were you doing? Were you doing working in clay and making bronzes, like lost wax kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I took um, we took the kids out to uh, Cornell Adult University, um, where my wife and my father in law went to um, went to college, and there's a summer program there. And so the kids took writing classes, and I took a bronze casting class. Mm. And Heidi did birding, and and uh, I just, I thought, wow, this is great. And then I mm -hmm. found another workshop in um, in Door County, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. at the Peninsula Art yep. School. And that's where I met, uh, the instructor was a professor at um, University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, which mm -hmm. is about 45 minutes from our house. Mm -hmm. And I said, boy, do you ever take students like me in your class? And she said, absolutely. And so she had me audit. I audited the class for six years, and then I was a volunteer agent and helping out. And you know, I'd open up the studio for students to get in, and mm -hmm. I built a couple furnaces. And they're using my furnace right now while they're waiting on a new furnace. Mm -hmm. But um, so yeah, I would I would on my days off pretty much spend all the time in in Whitewater, and 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 this uh, was like a school. It's a university, yeah. University. So they they've got a great foundry program there in the art department, mm. and um, so I learned all about um, lost wax casting using ceramic shell molds mm -hmm. and sand molds and um, and cast casting iron mm. um, and aluminum. So that's been that's been great. And then eventually I said, well, gee, I'm doing all this. Is it feasible for me? Should I even think about doing a master's in fine art? Mm -hmm. and You've been there six years, right? You said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So after a couple of years, I went to um, there's a, a graduate portfolio review that travel goes to different parts of the country. So I went down to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, mm -hmm. and I met um, I met admissions people from several different art schools, and I had the same question: Here's my portfolio. Right. Is this really something? Is this reasonable for me to think about doing this? And they right. all said yes. A couple of them said they'd waive the, the entrance fee. So, um, And that was at the Art School of Chicago? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And so, so you were able, so you're still practicing at this point, right? Right. And what years was this that you went to them for the master's? Oh, that program? was probably five, five or six years ago. Okay. And, and but, you know, I'm at that point, I'm the, the top producer in our hospital and we have several <laughs> doctors and, right. and I can't just walk away. Um, well, you could, but well, this hospital that I really poured yeah. everything no, I into, get it. you know, I get it. So it was several years of really lining things up so it can run without me, and it. and it does. It's it's doing great. 
So, and, and what point did you go back and get your master's? Or, well, I'm still working. I started a, this fall. Yeah. So this is, you finally start, and this is through the art. Minneapolis College of Art and art. Design. Okay. And so is it a two year program? Two years. Yeah. And you're pretty much out of the veterinarian thing now? Yeah. I call in for doctor meetings every two weeks and, yeah. and um, you know, provide some insight and, and hopefully some assistance, but um, I'm, on, I'm taking a, a two year sabbatical. And then the decision is um, mm -hmm. yet to be made. But I, I plan on going back at least two days a week. Decision's been made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the decision. We'll see. Been, we'll see. As soon as you got on this podcast, <laughs> I think the decision's been made. You know, I think at some point what happens in your head, I think it's already probably happened, is that you flipped from being a veterinarian to being an artist. And when you start calling yourself that, then you'll know it's completely flipped. You know, because I know I went to do the same thing. Right. You know, so I remember when it was like, no, nah, I'm not a doctor anymore. I'm, this is what I do. And so much of your identity is tied up. Of course in, it is. In your career from yeah. all the education and 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 I, I struggled with that. I and mean, that's that's probably more of what took five years to to flip the switch and make the decision. Of course. Was, was well, am I ready to stop being a veterinarian? Yeah. And um you know, so I There's still a lot of things that go with that. Yeah. I mean, you help people, you help animals. Right. That's your identity for the last 30 years. It's doctor is your last name. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, nope, I'm a bronze guy. Yeah. So, you know, I introduced myself to, I had a studio visit from, um, the one, of, well, the vice president to the, the college and, I introduced myself as a veterinarian. He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're, you're a sculptor and you, you're a veterinarian on the yeah. side. <laughs> no, he's right. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, I had to get rid of that. Yeah. That's with my own identity. I don't ever introduce myself as Dr. Sublet anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's just Mark or whatever. You know, it's just, and it's not that I, I'm still connected to medicine. I still do things associated with it in some form or fashion, but just for me, not for anything else, just because I have interest, still have interest. But yeah, I think you'll find the sooner you can make that flip and just say, no, yeah, this is who I am. This is who I am. And when you put it on your IRS form as artist, mm. then you'll know you're officially there. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know, because, you know, that's uh -huh. I used to put physician now it's art dealer. So, yeah. All right. So you're in your master's program. You just started in the this fall, right? Yes. So you've been doing it like six, three, just a few three, months. Three months, and that's full time, right? It is. Yeah. And so, what's that like? Oh, it's like it's like being a kid in a swimming pool, <laughs> and you know yeah. you have to go home and eat and sleep, yeah. and you don't want to. Yeah. So it's it's so much fun, and and earlier this fall, um, so my dad lives in St. Paul yeah. in the in the summer and in Florida in the winter. So I actually moved in with him. So I moved into my dad's basement right. <laughs> at that's this nice. age. You are a kid, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was just really nice to reconnect with him, and um, but. Uh, yeah, I go in early in the morning. I come back late at night. And yeah. if I get tired of one thing, I move on to something else. Yeah. And, you know, I'll be, um, I'll be sculpting in clay. Then I'll shift over to mold making or welding mm -hmm. or finishing a piece. And I, I just float back from one thing to the next. And so many things have downtime in between, you know, the, the mold making, you, mm -hmm. you, you dip something in the ceramic shell slurry and then you got to leave it dry for half a day. So right. you go on and do something else. Mm -hmm. And it's really neat. And so how, the program lasts for two years. Yeah. And so what do you want to do once you get that? What's the purpose of getting the master's? Is it just to increase your ability, your knowledge in that? Or is there some other plan? Or do you know? Well, I, I always said I don't really need the degree or the right. piece of paper. I, I'm already no, I casting it. things. But um, I'm starting to do larger public art pieces. And, and I want a better basis in or a better foundation in... Uh, composition mm. if i'm going to make something that that takes a foundry 10 months to create mm -hmm. i want to make sure it's right when it's in clay and uh, and i want to push myself into into new areas and that's exactly what's happening so. mm -hmm. yeah because you showed me this piece that's for a veterinarian college or something yeah it's for the university of wisconsin school of veterinary medicine i mean it's fantastic in fact if you'll you. give us those photos we'll make sure we put them on the sure. podcast too sure. so people can see it but you know it's really a beautiful i mean Thank that's you. really when i saw that on your i think it was on your website sure. 
I was like, oh, well, this guy's a real artist. I mean, he, he, he clearly <laughs> he clearly is a sculptor. I don't know what all this other stuff about <laughs> vet stuff was, but he clearly is a sculptor. And um, so, it, you know, you, when you were trying to make that decision, you made it, and it's going to affect you in a way that you see it differently. But you were a, you were an artist then. You're an artist now. It's just you know when your back is a kid in a pool, you know. Yeah. Clearly, there's something <laughs> there. So that'll finish up in about two years, more or less. Yeah. And then you're you're gonna do something, and that's probably why you were reaching out to me, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'd like to. Um, well, now that I have this big piece for the university, right. I think that'll open some doors for. And that's a commission that they did. Right, right. I approached them. They were building another, a, a new building, a second building. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I approached them thinking I would donate uh, a small piece to, to go in the entryway mm -hmm. or something. And, and then it, the more we talked, it, it morphed into this major commission mm. and, and this, this really big piece that's six feet tall and 12 feet wide and yeah. seven feet deep. And it's going to be at the entrance of the school. Mm. And, um, so I would like to do more public art pieces. Um, I I also have commissions. I do a lot of awards for, I mean, I, I sculpt what I'm passionate about. So mm -hmm. um, I've been coaching log rolling, lumberjack sport. Oh for, yeah, I remember you telling me about yeah, that. Yeah, for over 40 years. And so I do the awards for the Steel Timber Sport Series, trophies and medals and the Lumberjack World Championships. And then I cross country ski race. I do the trophies for the American Burger mm -hmm. Miner ski race. Um, let's talk about this lumberjack thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they had some, they had something out here in Tucson actually really? the other day. Yeah. There's some competition. I was like, Oh, that would have been cool to see. So yeah. that's the log rolling, throwing sure. the ax, right? Sure. Sure. Fast chopping, a, a, a wood, you know, a piece of lumber Yeah. and you have to, and another one where you have to climb to the top and yeah. chop it. Right. Yeah. And then you have the double saw. I was like, see how much I know about there this? There you go. There you and go. And I didn't read ahead of it. I actually enjoy <laughs> watching those things uh, on you know YouTube or TV. I found them very interesting, very athletic, yeah. super athletic. Yeah. So did you compete, I assume, in those things too? Right, right. So I, I started out log rolling. And, yeah, that would be uh, fun. As, That's got to be the most fun. I mean, one. you goof up, you fall in the water. What's yeah. more fun than that? Yeah, right? no, I know. So, and then I, I, I've coached log rolling since I was <laughs> like 16. That's so, so, um, and then I, I ended up in, uh, in, I paid a lot of vet school tuition doing lumberjack shows. So, um, I had an agent that would book shows around the Eastern U S yes. and, um, I would log roll and canoe joust and pull a cross cut saw and ax throw. And then we had a couple, I didn't chop cause I need my fingers and toes. So, yeah. um, uh, so we had other guys that would do that, but, um, it was, it was great fun. And, and I, you know, get to travel around and see different parts of the country. And mm -hmm. I always wanted to go back to vet school when I was done with the carnival circuit. You know, I met a lot of really fascinating people, different way of life. And, How long did you do that? That, uh, oh, uh, that was probably four or five years in college. So while you were in college, you were doing these things in the in, summer, in the summer to mm -hmm. make money for what you figured was vet school. Yeah. Yeah. I see. And it would last for two or three months and you would just, you get out of, uh, out of college for the summer and then you'd immediately go on the, as you say, carnival circuit. Right. Right. That's so crazy. Yeah. Just, he would, um, my agent would book shows. And <laughs> how much say, do you get paid if you don't mind me? Yeah, well, at that point, curious. if I could clear a hundred dollars a day, I mean, this was in the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, if I could clear a hundred dollars a day after expenses yeah. and I would take the show and, um, and it's fun, you know, you do three shows a day and then mm -hmm. I could work out. And, <laughs> you are working out uh, the whole time. Yeah, that too. Yeah. And canoe jousting. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the of the program, the sport? Well, that's... I, I've that's, never seen that one. Yeah, that's not necessarily a competitive event. It was more a show, yeah. a show event. So It's a real thing though, right? Yeah. You're yeah. really trying to knock the other guy out of the canoe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. With so a, you have with a, a jousting stick. You have a long pole with a rubber ball on the end of it. <laughs> you whack away at each other, and That's I funny. mean, it's all it's all a fun show, but yeah, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Is that how you got the noggin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's very interesting. So anyway, you love these sports. You're still associated with. Yeah, I this? still coach. Um, I still coach. We, I, I, the world championships, I coach somewhere between 20 and 25 rollers, mm. um, log rollers and boom runners. And, um, have you won any of those awards or any of your students? Oh yes. Yeah. Well, the, 
our our team swept the men's podium the last three years in the world wow. championships wow. and second place in the women's the last several years so wow. um but that, i i coached from age age seven on up to world champions so yeah and is it all is this a world kind of thing too do people do it in other places or is this a really an american kind of yeah the log thing? rolling is um primarily u.s and canada mm-hmm um the the other timber sports are around the world mm. um they're very big in in europe and um, australia and new zealand mm. Interesting. So, and have you gone around internationally to those kind of things too? i have not no no okay. my brother does he's the head judge for the steel timber sports series so he just got back from sweden mm. for that that's what? his side gig he's a forestry researcher so. yeah well it's natural he'd be yeah. a log roller then right <laughs> I'm sure he just gets shit about that all the time. (laughs) (laughs) So you do, so you've been doing commissions for things that you enjoy, Mm -hmm. which is the lumberjack and cross country skiing. That's the other one. Yeah. Yeah. It's perfect for you to be in Minnesota for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in heaven. And, uh, and then you, how did you get the big commission for this piece that you're doing? That's so huge. I mean, cause you came to him, you're just going to give him a piece. And then all of a sudden somehow it metamorphs into, a major sculpture. That's an expensive sculpture to do yes. that. How yeah. did you arrange that? I'm asking this just because that's a business acumen to somehow make that happen. Yeah. And I would, I would say I stumbled into it. I mean, it's, it's a lot of who, you know, like anything. Um, but uh, the administrators at the veterinary school and their donors liked my work mm-hmm. and they liked the connection I had to the school. And, um, I remember it was right at the beginning of COVID. It was supposed to be an in-person meeting. It was my first zoom meeting. Right. And, um, we were looking at, at the, the architects renderings of different places and, and, um, they just kept coming back to the entrance of the school and this large space. Mm. And so I put together some designs and, and they liked what I had and, and they kept making it bigger and I kept asking them to go (laughs) smaller and we, we arrived somewhere in between, but um, it, it just was through conversation and, and it was a collaborative design process. So I had the idea it's, it's a pyramid of books Yes. and each level depicts things that happen in a different year of vet school. So mm. first year at the bottom level up to fourth year mm-hmm. and graduating on the top level. And so I proposed, uh, interviewing students, faculty, alumni, um, staff and, and finding out what's really iconic about each year mm. of school. Yeah. And they really liked that. I mean, the goal of the piece is to, to increase the bond between um, people that are involved in the vet school and the school itself. And, mm-hmm. and so there are people, I mean, I, I use students to model. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are students that are going to, they're bring their kids back or grandkids back right. and say, you know, I modeled for this pose and, and other people that'll look at it and say, Hey, that was my idea. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think it will increase the, the really the bond that people have to the school. And so was that idea of building it for a second, third, fourth year, was that your idea? Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Mm-hmm. So you came up with the idea, took some input for other people, and then did you ultimately pitch the idea and say, here it is? Well, I had the contract before all the interviews and all the time in the design okay. process. Yeah. So it was pretty well set that I was going to be the one to, to build it. Um and they they still wanted uh, they wanted to approve things, so I would yeah. send them drawings and and then um, uh, clay sketches mm-hmm. and and then finish out the pieces. And there was some input, some back and forth mm-hmm. um, that I think made the sculpture better. And they had to get donors too, right? Yes, to do it. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you don't start the pro- that kind of project until you have the donors. Yeah. And how yeah. close are you to having that project completed? Well, I just delivered it to a foundry in Colorado ah, a few weeks ago okay. uh, to the mold makers and the foundry, and they're going to take about 10 months, and mm. then they'll deliver it and install it well, in August or September. Of next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've been working on it how long? Oh, boy. Um, really, I started the interviews um, spring of 2020. Yeah. And then... So here we so are, it folks. A, yeah. yeah. It was a couple of years of, of sculpting, and while also... Um, practicing medicine right and, right you know so and i did cut back a little bit at work and that was part of the the plan was to gradually cut back mm. and and allowed me to put more time into this piece yeah okay start asking me questions you wanted to know questions that all right <laughs> good that, good you know i'm free good you're the interviewee or yeah yeah so um 
I guess, uh, just how does the gallery process work? I mean, what, when, when, when an artist comes to you, um, do you, I'm assuming you prefer that they send you an email or send you a letter pictures first and then, and then you meet with them or. So, yeah. So the question basically is how do I get in the gallery kind of thing? Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, that makes sense, right? You're going to be done. And are you going to try to go to galleries by the way? Are you going to look at it? Okay. So, you know, it's very interesting. And I think every gallery is a little different. In fact, I'm sure they are. Um, as a, if I were in your shoes, the first thing I would do is I would, uh, look at all the galleries that were locally close by um, to, first of all, you have bronze. It's weighs a lot. It's expensive to ship it. Yeah. And you probably are going to do some of the subject matter is going to be pertinent to your specific area, right? You know, you have a lumberjack as one of your bronzes. Eh, I'm not going to sell it too well here, mm-hmm. but you might in Minneapolis or somewhere else. So I think it's very important to try to hone in on what galleries would be appropriate to begin with for the subject matter that you have and your abilities, right? So you're kind of a different beast because you have already done commissions. You know, you have a record, even though you're a brand new student, you're just now getting out of art school. Eh, It's a little different. You have, you've been doing it off and on your entire life and you are good at it. So you could probably, uh, you know, go after galleries that are um, higher end galleries than you know, if you had just started and was real day one. So if you're day one, that's the other thing I would say, and you don't have any background to uh, get to a better gallery, start with local galleries too that aren't, you know, don't shoot for the stars, right? So you can, but you're going to probably be disappointed because most gallerists, like myself, the things we look at, again, for me, the first thing I look at is, quality okay i'm gonna i which is again a little different than some galleries but i'm looking at do i really have a connection to this piece whatever it might be right is this something that really moves me and i think it's good then i'm going to deep do a delve into is this what's the background on this person you know is is this person academically trained or they're not actually how old are they how committed they are to it Uh, What have they done? You know, where are they located now as far as the material and what Mm -hmm. galleries are they in? But number one thing for me is going to be, do I like it? And do I think it's something that resonates? That's number one. I think that's different than a lot of galleries. I think a lot of them would say, I want to see your CV first. They're going to start with that. Okay. Which is whether it's fair or unfair, that's what they're going to start with. They're going to say, you know, what have you, where are you showing? What have you won? What are your price structure potentially? You know, what are your sales? And um, and then they may look because not all galleries care as much about does it move them as do you have a path that they can see that this person's good and they can sell and they'll be able to sell your work because they do a lot of galleries look at it as quote unquote a product and that was mm-hmm. air air. Is it gonna move? Is it gonna move? I don't care as much about that, honestly. It's a weird thing. I should probably, <laughs> but it's really does it move me. Now, again, now it can move me and I can go, I can't sell it. It's not my thing. So certain things, I've had some sculpture that I couldn't sell because, um, for instance, wildlife, I don't seem to do very well with wildlife unless it's like lizards and turtles, turtles tortoises and snakes and things that are in my realm of the desert and things that I find interesting to some extent. So I'm going to have a hard time selling a moose. Have I sold a moose? Yeah, I have. Mm -hmm. I can sell a bison because I deal in Western and Native American stuff. So, you know, it might be something that even though you're really good, I might go, "Eh, I don't think it's, I can sell it. You know, Mm -hmm. this just isn't my field. Um, So when you get ready to, you're graduating, you're really starting to go, okay, I want to get a gallery. You get back to your original question. How do you go about it? First thing you do is it's not good form to just show up. Right. Right. Now, you know that because you contacted me and said, I would like to set up an appointment. If you don't mind, here I am. This is what I am, what I've done, you know, to ask these questions that we're asking now. And that's the right way to do it. Best thing that, well, at least for me, again, I can only speak to myself, but what I want to see if you contact me as a website or Instagram account or Facebook. You know, so I can actually just look at, I will look at those things and see if it's something that's of interest to me. Um, 
it's better not to send a portfolio of things that are, you know, that you, or if you do send a portfolio of like fancy, you know, you know, photographs and things put in there, you do not have to return because there's oh, okay. nothing worse than getting a big portfolio of stuff you didn't ask for that you don't like and is not your subject. And they clearly even didn't look to see. And then they go, please send it back. You know, <laughs> you know, you can put the envelope with the thing in for them to send it back and maybe they will, but it's better not, not to do it. Now you can do that. David Mickle did that. David Mickle's an artist of mine, but I had actually seen his stuff when I was in Utah and said to the curator of the museum, this guy's great. I love this guy's stuff. He's really good. Who he is? And then she told me, da, da, da. and then he, the curator talked to him and he goes, okay, he likes it already. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to send this super professional, you know, portfolio with my stuff. And he probably put an envelope in it to send back if I wanted. I kept it. Yeah. You know, and he was great. And he became one of my artists. And that was very smart on his part to do that because I'm busy. I loved his work, but I didn't reach back out to, you know, try to contact him, which I probably should have as a gallerist, but I didn't. And he had the smarts to go, okay, I know he likes it. He's talking to a curator about everything about it. And I even said, oh yeah, you should let him know I really like his work. So he sends it to me. So again, for you, I would go and start by looking, you know, what kind of, what kind of art are you going to do primarily? Do you know when you start as a fine artist, what are your, you know, it's got to be stuff that inspires you, but what is that subject matter going to be? Right, right. Well, um, a, a lot of the uh, outdoors. Um, so I'm working with a lot of tree bark texture right now mm -hmm. and incorporating that into my pieces. Um, still figurative pieces with um, skiers and lumberjack sports. And, yeah, this kind of thing. And uh, I, I really work best when I'm working on something that I'm super excited yeah. about. So, um, so it'll yeah. be in that field, the things sure. you've already been doing sure. as commissions, right? Right, right. But I mean, are you going to be doing moose or deer or small dogs or cats or any of that stuff? I mean, you, you know the subject matter clearly. Yeah, yeah. Or does um, that not interest you? You go, yeah, I, I've had enough of my No, the do dog. dogs and cats will probably be part of my work. Um, I've done some, um, like I did a commission for the White Stallion mm -hmm. uh, Ranch. Um, it was a, a horse and cowboy jumping out of a book because the... The dude ranches, the guest yeah, ranches cool. make the stories come alive. And Yeah, that's cool. Um, See, that can be sold so, west. That could be a western mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm, you yeah. Know. yeah, but I think um, I'm still evolving and right. still still finding where um, where I'm going to focus. Yeah, um, So, and I think that's an important thing to be doing in these next two years. Right. Is find out who I am, what I am, and what's my voice. Mm -hmm. It's really important. You know, because am I going to do lumberjack stuff and skiing? You can, and you might be super successful. I'm not kidding. You might be super successful because I don't know how much of that is out there done by really qualified mm -hmm. sculptors. So, you know, there may be a real interest and an area for that kind of stuff. And even maybe on your own as your own website, your own Instagram sure. You know, so it's not to be, de I'm not dismissive of that at all. In fact, I could see it as a lane, a very interesting lane. Because, I mean, they've got all these shows and all this stuff that's a way bigger than I would have ever guessed it. Sure. So that means there's a lot of people who are interested in it. And yeah, I'm not sure there's the fine arts link. And, and that's why I'm, I'm excited about the point in my career where I'm at. I don't have to make a living with this. I can I can create things that I'm passionate right. about. Um, it's, it's awfully nice on the ego when, when people like it enough to buy it. Right. Um, you know, I think the, the Western art field is very full of artists. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's successful. There's a lot of people that buy bronzes. There are a lot of places to, to, to market that. Yeah, it is. And the lumberjack sports, you know, not so much. So, right. um, so it might do well in a place like jackson or you know bozeman or some of those sure. places in the montana where they you know in idaho some of those where it, sure. you know it resonates you know again something like what you're doing i could see a great instagram account that incorporates both the actual events that are going on mm -hmm. so people can you know i like to watch that stuff right i live in the southwest i like to watch it i find it interesting sure. you know and if you are incorporating with the art as well and going this is what i do here's what it is I could see that also being from a self-promotion, but, you know, finding your voice and honing in as, as soon as you can, especially you're older, right? 
you don't have the time to wait. Right. It's, you know, right. it's true. You need, and if you want to make a lane and something and be really successful, you need to do it sooner than later. And so if you can find what really you're, you're, you're good at, what resonates, you, like you said, you don't have to make, the, you know, the money by selling. You want to. It's important, clearly. But it's not like you're not going to eat if you. Right. So that gives you some leeway that other artists don't have sometimes that you can be more free with, you know, the subject matters you choose to do just because you go, I like this and I want to do it. Right. And let right. the market come to me. I'll do the best I can and let the market come to me. You know, doing the big commission that you did, I think, really opens your world up for those kind of things as well because those are hard to get they're expensive but you've done one and you, once you've completed it that's a very good basis for you to be able to go okay what else is out there sure you know and you might sure. really love them you may find them very fun to do i don't know yeah how that that works out for you. yeah and then the nice thing about those bigger pieces is, is subunits or smaller pieces sure. that are incorporated in it can stand alone that's right and the little so, maquettes that you can yeah. sell them that's yeah. exactly right because so, you put in the effort and the work right right yeah right um, one of the questions, um, some of my classmates were wondering is if you get a portfolio, you see work that doesn't really fit your gallery. Do you ever forward that on or, or make suggestions of where, where else they might go? Right. So if you have, let's say you do a variety of kinds of things as an artist, right? Mm -hmm. I say send it all. Yeah. Again, I think website, Instagram, Facebook are the best ways because they can immediately go to it. I think having a good website personally is is very important. Also, don't show them a bad website. So that also detracts. If I see somebody's a good artist, but their website's just terrible. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it makes you go, do they really, How? what are their aesthetics really if they'll allow this to be their brand? So you just want it clean, navigatable, uh, with the things, but you just break them down. You just don't put, you know, uh, moose in with a guy doing a log, you know, you mm -hmm. animals or figures or, you know, break it into areas so they can see, oh, you're multi -ta you're multi-talented, you have multi-disciplines, you can go and see this. Because I have artists that can do more than one thing and often do, and I just, they know that, you know, I may not want their seascapes, I want their Western landscapes, sure. those kind of sure. things. Right. But I might want the others, or and I have. Francis Livingston does Western um, figurative work, but he also does this insanely beautiful seascape of, of roller coasters and Ferris wheels and big buildings, and I've sold those as well. They're great. I have one in my own collection. So, you know, I think if you don't send that, you may limit yourself because you don't know, you never know what the artist or the dealer, the dealer that's doing whatever they're doing, what their interests are, or maybe they have more than one gallery, or maybe they have, you know, multiple disciplines, and they might not even like what you think, you, you think they're going to like A, and it's actually B that they're interested in okay. because they're just going, let's say, into modern art or more modern stuff, and yours are more, you're doing both, right? And maybe they're just going into that, and they're looking for artists. That's the other problem that you have is you are always competing with like so somebody like me who's been in it for 30 years you know you've got to compete against all the artists that i've already represent many of them for 25 years right. you know how many more artists do i want or need well they have to be very unique they have to have their own voice and they have to add something that i see adds to what i have and doesn't also compete with some other artists sure so if somebody's i've represented for 25 years and has been you know giving them material and we're have a great relationship and you know they supported me i supported them and somebody comes in and it's kind of similar and it's going to cut into their market then i'm going to not take that artist even though they're good mm -hmm. and i might tell that person you're good but you know, try these places, but this is gonna. I'm afraid it might compete too much. Okay. So, and I don't want to. I don't want to do that to my artists. Sure. Not all galleries feel that way. Some would be like, "Yeah, great, I can sell a cheaper version." Yeah. But okay. you know, it just depends. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing. At when you're first going out, talk to and if you if there's a gallery you're kind of interested in, you think it might be a good gallery, call the artists that are represented if you know oh, them. That's a good point. Say, eh, what's this guy like? Is it a good person? Or is it, how's it? You know. How's their business dealings? You should talk to other artists. 
Other artists that are actually in the galleries will give you the most advice, good advice, straight shooting advice about what you're getting yourself into. Because not all galleries are, you know, not that great. Sometimes they're bad money. Sometimes they're just slow pays. There's all sorts of things. Maybe they're just don't really like the art. They just use it, look at it as more a way to make money. Not all art galleries really are will love the art or artists. They're more looking at it as a business. So stay away sure. from those if you can. Yeah. So if you can, <laughs> got to figure out who they are. Though. Figure them out first. Yeah. yeah. But that's a good point. That's yep. a good point. Now, once you, uh, once you have a relationship with an artist, you know, what, right. what do you expect from the artist? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, we kind of lay those terms out when we start, you know, here's my commissions. This is what I do. This is what I expect as far as, um, you know, if I'm going to advertise, you know, you may need help in advertising, depending on what it is. Um, you know, maybe if you, you know, for discounting at times, we may have to have those where we have those discussions. But the main thing I expect from an artist is that well, one thing, if I represent them, I just say, listen, I'm in Tucson. Don't show in Tucson, <laughs> you know. OK, so that town is mine. I don't need the state. A lot of dealers are going to say. I need you not to be in Arizona. Just me, all right? That happens all the time. Artists can do it. I think that's a mistake. Okay. You know, maybe if it's a city that was right next to it, like M Minneapolis and, and St. Paul. Sure. Yeah, I can see going, no, Minneapolis or St. Paul, no. But you want to show in any other place in Minnesota or Chicago, whatever, I don't care. So there are a lot of dealers that will make you sign contracts that say you're exclusive only for this state or maybe even the whole country a lot wow. of people i talked to an artist i really like to show a native artist he signed up with somebody he signed him up and said nobody in the united states i'm like really that's not a good deal for you mm -hmm. it's a really bad deal for you so i would stay away from those contract uh, contracts most galleries do contracts like that i don't have any contracts my contracts are you bring the art in we fill a consignment form you're pieces listed and what it's going to sell for and all that but i don't make you sign a year contract or six i don't care if you're not happy please leave mm -hmm. if i'm not happy i'll see you later do a lot of galleries do that yep they do yep and period I, a certain period of time yep. certain and i would be somewhat wary of that quite okay. frankly you know or if they if you're going to do it and if it's a really good one i would, wouldn't make it very long okay you know make it a year at the most because it's just you know it's, I think it puts a lot of, uh, it, it's not in your advantage, I think, as an artist. It's more in the dealer's advantage. Right. right. Then the other thing that, you know, the hardest part right now for artists and dealers is, is there are dealers that don't want their artists to be showing uh, on it, selling themselves, right? On Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or whatever it is. I understand these reasonings too, because they put in a lot of money on advertising, giving you wall space. They do all these things that are providing you uh, a benefit to your brand and your name, and then you're not getting it. You're not giving them everything. That can be a problem. I, for me, I don't really go down that road. I, you know, I prefer my artists don't sell a lot on Instagram because if they can't give me enough material, why, you know, why are you in my gallery? Why am mm -hmm. I spending money on it? Full page ads. And talking to people and my staff and doing everything for you so you need to set those parameters out some galleries do not want you to sell on their own on your own social media i think that's i don't see how that's going to last in the long run because you know it's just the way it is right and social media is very important so and you're as a doing if you're doing social media yourself you're also help building your brand too and so that should be you know there should be some recognition on the dealer's part that okay this is helping me as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, main thing for me, from an artist, I would just, you know, get me material, you know, and on, on a, you know, timely basis. Um, and uh, I don't ask artists to paint certain things. I don't do that. You know, again, I may be a little different, you know. I think the best work comes from your soul, from your creative being. You know, you produce what you think is great and then give it to me. Mm -hmm. Now, I might say, you know, I'm not going to do great with Eastern landscapes or European work, you know, if Southwest or what, or the West is going to be more. Because sometimes artists go to Europe and they paint and they have all these great stuff and I may not be able to sell it. And I'll just say, I just don't think I can sell this. I can 
Sure. You know, or maybe I can't. John and Terry Moyers do Hawaii pieces. I love their Hawaii pieces. I've sold them. I've had shows for them. So, you know, it's, uh, it depends on uh, what they do. But again, I don't tell artists to what, you know, to produce. I'm not going to, if you're my artist, I'm not going to say, make me tortoises. You know? Sure. Because if you don't like tortoises or don't feel anything, you're not going to want to do it. Why should you? You know, right. why did you go? You didn't go into art to, you know, to do that. You know, that's more like a, uh, you know, illustration. If you want to go into illustration and I'm paying you a contract and say, do this for me, I'm paying you for this. That's fine. But, mm -hmm. you know, as an artist, you know, no. So be, be wary of contracts. Be wary of long term exclusive contracts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very reasonable and pretty much standard if you're in that city. That's you shouldn't be selling in other galleries in that setting. So, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I we were in Jackson a couple of years ago and mm -hmm. wandering around galleries and chatting with people. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't bring a portfolio or show any work or right. anything, but just asking them like how they find their artists and what they expect from them. And and several of them said, when a piece sells, they want to get another piece in right away. Yeah. Because if it's not on the floor, it's they don't have a chance to sell it. Yeah. So I, I imagine that's part of what you're looking for as well. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, so sculptors are different than painters to some extent, right? Because in sculpting, you may be able to get a piece right away, right? You may be able to just have another one made foundry-wise, right. right, if it's an addition. Painting may not be that easy. Um, I would like it if I get, you know, pieces like that. But I don't expect that, actually. Okay. You know? I mean, they're going to want to get me work, mm -hmm. right? If I just sold a big painting, you know, they're going to be like, okay, you know, I'll get you another one. You know, so again, I have a, a little bit of an unusual gallery because I have a variety of material. Mm -hmm. So I have a large amount of contemporary art, but I have deceased work. I have native art and other things like that. That So I'm not dependent on every, you know, if I'm a painting sells and I don't have one to replace it, I don't eat. Nah, it doesn't affect me as much because I have other things going along. But yes, I think most dealers expect if you're doing a good job that you're going to get material as you sell it and more is going to come. Question is, as an artist, do you provide more material when the dealer isn't selling? Okay. You know, or when they call you and go, I need, I, I'm not selling anything. I need some more work. And you're like, ah. Now they might, sometimes they might go, we need some work that's, we've had this for a while, everybody's seen it, haven't been able to do, maybe we can switch out, you know, maybe we can get some different paintings or sculptures or whatever it might be, you know, maybe trade from a different gallery even. So, and that's not unreasonable, but, you know, you also have to, at some point you go, okay, is this gallery working for me? Right. You know, you've had my work for two years, you haven't sold much. Sure. Because you know? if the work's there, it's not somewhere else. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. And bronzes are very expensive. Right. Right. So you're going to have a lot of money out in bronzes. So the good part is you can have them in different places. But if you have, you know, three galleries and they all have the same exact sculpture, you know, if for some reason you can't sell that sculpture very well, now you've got three copies of one that didn't sell. Exactly. <laughs> so it's better to figure out, you know, which ones are going to sell and then make it, maybe make doubles of those. And I think... Another question that people ask me is how many galleries should I have? You know, I think three is a really good number, not more than three. Okay. You can have anywhere between one and three. You know, if you, as a sculptor, you can have a few more because you can make enough because of, if you have enough material already that you've produced, you can make additions and get them out to, but as a painter, if you're a good painter, you know, you're going to be hard pressed to keep three solid, good galleries, you know, filled because, you know, they should be doing their jobs. And if they're top end, they're going to be selling their paintings. And you're going to be like, yep, I can't keep them all filled. So. Okay. Yeah, that was another question I had was, you know, how much, before I start reaching out to galleries, how much inventory should I have? I mean. Um, That's a good question. Yeah, because I can. How much do you think you should have? Right. <laughs> I'm asking you. How much do you think you should have? Well, I think. Hmm. There's two parts of that question. One is additions of the same piece, mm -hmm. and another is how many different pieces right. are available. And um, um, and then how do you pick which ones you think? I mean, which ones you think are going to sell? I, I think that's probably a discussion to have with the gallery is because they've got a lot of experience. In yeah, well, you won't. Know, you're not going to know which pieces are going to sell. 
So you just you the pieces you I as like. a you as an artist, you're probably not gonna right. know, um, and because you're just doing what you like and what you know motivates you to do it to, in the first place to put on all the time. And so you know, I think th there are dealers who should be able to go. Yeah, I think this is going to be a harder sell than X. You mm -hmm. know, and um, I think a starting point for a sculptor. I think a dozen pieces, you know, in your portfolio would be reasonable, you know, 10 to 12, you know, you're just starting. That's going to take you a year, mm -hmm. you know, or more. So mm -hmm. just to get enough up, and, you know, if you, if, and you know, if you're really getting great feedback, maybe you can start trying with three or four, right? You can go, I, these are my four and this is my best stuff. This one I'm, I think, and they, if you're really good, they may go, yeah, those are good. We can, I'm, I'm, I'm on board to try with this and see what else you produce. So, but yes, I think a bigger number, 12, I would think would be a decent number for, you know, a sculptor, for a painter. I would think they should have like 25 paintings, Okay. you know, because what if they're selling, right? You mm -hmm. know, you, you, you come on with 25 and I sell 10 or 12 of them right off the back or 20 of them. And they're like, okay. <laughs> Any more, you know? Right. So right. you want to have some to be able, because you can only produce it. That's why I say don't have many, too many galleries. Right. Because you can get in a bind, you know? So Ed Mel is a very well-known, you know, artist. He has basically two galleries, you know, and he sells some himself. So, and he's done that his whole life. It's basically two to three galleries. And he, and he can't keep up. So, yep. Yeah. So, again, sculpture is a little different because you can have more, because you can make more additions. additions. Yeah. But more is not better, honestly. It doesn't, you know, oh, I've got 10 galleries. Well, I saw, if I saw you had 10 galleries, I go, eh, I don't think I want to, this guy's everywhere. And yeah. he's just so overexposed or whatever. Just, you know, three, I can see, three okay. or four. Yeah. Or even two. Or, no. Yeah. Because uh, for me, you know, I can, I can sculpt in clay and set it aside, but. I have to decide what to pull the trigger on, right. what to send to the mold maker and get in that found because mold making and, and foundry is going to take a couple of months. Yeah. And, um, and then how many, how much inventory do I have yeah. of a particular piece and, and how do I decide what's the addition size? Yeah. For, you know, you know so it is a time related kind of a deal, you know, generally for a medium size, you know, sculpture, 14 by 14, whatever. You know, maybe 35 in addition. It's a something you're going to have to decide right off the bat. Right. You know, do I have one, you know, is this a one of five, one of 10, one of, you know, one of a hundred. So, you know, generally when they get over 35, I'm like, eh, that's a lot, you know? Um, and I like it personally. If it's a bigger, the bigger the sculpture, the less addition should be, the less number in the addition. So, Interesting. Okay. yeah. So if it's like a, you know, full, big monument well let's say it's a monumental like a six foot sculpture yeah maybe it'll have five or three okay you know and if it's a medium sized thing maybe seven to twelve you know and they go as the addition as the sculpture gets smaller the addition gets bigger you know so and then i have some you know sculptures that you know might even do 50 and i, I see them do 250 and 350 i would never buy a sculpture like that personally you know um and if you're some sculptors can go really low additions you know they go five or ten additions that's very low for a medium-sized sculpture i would think you'd want at least 25 to 35 i think that's kind of a golden number and then you as a sculptor you may also go okay i want things that are uh unlimited you can have unlimited just smalls right things that you like that are really nice you know, little rabbits or whatever they might be that are small you know, that are sell for 150 to 250 bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can be unlimited. You can make as many as you want. They're a good way to pay the bills. Dealers, a lot of dealers might like them just because they can always have them. You can have lots on board. You don't have to worry about keeping which edition it is, which number is sold. And that's the other thing. You got to keep track right. of all this stuff, right? And it's very critical for a sculptor. You keep not track of where every piece is, right? And what's out there and where. Yep. And mm -hmm. don't screw up your numbers. Right. Because I've seen that happen before, too. Really? Oh, yeah. You know, they do two 11s, you know. Oops. You know, it's easy. It can happen. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I thought we did 11 already. Nope, you didn't, you know. 
it was you know and they do the double so and then you have to deal with that component when it happens it probably happened to almost all sculptors i bet wow yeah so be careful and then i'm assuming each piece has a certificate of authenticity that that's up to the dealer through. basically okay but, yeah not really your job to do that oh that's, really nope that's what the, you're paying them to for, for us yes Everything gets a certificate of authenticity. Okay. And it'll say, bronze number two of 15, whatever. The title, mm -hmm. blah, 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 when it was done. A picture. That kind of stuff. Yep, picture, yeah. all that stuff. And you prepare that? Yep, I do. Interesting. On all okay. things. Yeah, you don't have to do that. Yep, Great. Not, not your responsibility. So what other things, I mean, you mentioned uh, galleries do marketing and, and yep. the, the certificate. What other things does a gallery provide? What should an artist expect from a gallery? Well, a good website, for one. Mm -hmm. So... Used to be it would just be a good gallery, right? You'd want to see a great gallery that's in a good location, it's big or whatever, you know, but it's, you know, that's a lot of what you're paying for is that location, right? But you're also paying for the website. Do they have social media? How many followers do they have? What kind of social media? Do they have a YouTube channel? Do they have, you know, TikTok? Do they have, what do they have? You know, do they have a, a website that is a very navigable website? Can you buy off that website? Does it have content? You know, those are all things you know, that you are paying for. So if you're in my gallery, you're getting a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Millions of views on YouTube and, you know, big social media component and a website that's, you know, powerful that people can buy and there's lots of content. So, you know, if I were looking, I would be looking specifically to see what their, you know, what their physical structure is, but also what their online structure is. I think that's very important you're paying for. That's a very expensive thing. Mm -hmm. for an artist to do you know and yeah and we want to spend our i want to spend my time sculpting right. not not manipulating my website and right instagram account yeah yours that, needs so. just to be kind of a static page kind of mm -hmm. thing that has stuff with links to your wet to the dealers that represent you okay. you know so people can see read your story they can see some things they can see your what you have and then the galleries that sell you let them do the, the heavy lifting that's what you're paying them to do Mm -hmm. But they better have the website to be able to, you know, do their job. If they don't have a good website, even if they got a great, you know, physical building, I'd want to talk to the other artists that are in there and say, okay, how's sales? What's, you know, what well, you have a great gallery, no website or bad website. What happens in the pandemic? Hmm? Right. You're in trouble. They're probably already <laughs> out of business, those people, or some of them are. Sure. Because they went two years without making sales. Mm -hmm. So, website. Um, you mentioned commissions. Yep. What, what is there? Do galleries have a range of, of commissions depending on the gallery, how much they take or what? Yeah. I mean, it's usually that... just going to be, you know, depending on what it is, a huge commission is super expensive. You know, it might not be as big of a commission, but generally it's just the same as it would be for your sculpture. Yeah. So those are less common. I don't think I've done very few sculpture commissions. They're hard to do. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't think most galleries are going to even be that interested in trying to pursue those. Those are things you can probably pursue on your own. Okay. You know? Yeah. But as far as the percentage that the gallery Same takes thing. in exchange for marketing and the website and right. all that, um, does is that you know is like fifty percent standard? So or? It usually depends on what where you are in the realm of you know how good you are and how long you've been there. But you know, standard is kind of sixty forty for the dealer versus the artist it could be 70 30 if you're well known it could even be 80 20 if you're a really great artist and you know you're you know killing it but generally it's like kind of 60 40 okay you know a lot of artists a lot of galleries that are you know maybe not dealing in higher tier artists might even do 50 50 we've never done that but that's you know our our gallery artists are at a much higher level and they're no way they're going to do that nor should they they shouldn't have to so they mm -hmm. can sell on their own probably. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so when you started this gallery, how did you decide what what type of art? Um, I mean, Western and Native is, right. is ob an obvious choice for this area. But right. Th then you've got the modern art right. thrown in there as well. How did you come about? So for me, it's what I like, right? Okay. So, you know, I grew up in New Mexico. I've always loved native arts, been collecting since a little kid. You know, the Western art was, you know, a natural. I like that. Um, so it was literally, and it still is what I like. Mm -hmm. Every piece in this gallery is what I like. So I wouldn't take on an artist that I didn't, wouldn't put in my own house. 
Nice. So, you know, if it's not going in my house, it's not going in your house. So <laughs> I don't care how much money they may sell or whatever. For me, it has to be, you know, I, you come in the gallery and go, yeah, oh, yeah, there's a sense, right? There's a, there's a symbiosis of, you know, that all fits and flows and you go, yeah, I like this. And, you know, and if you don't like the art, like some of the art in my gallery, you're probably not going to like any of it because there is me in a lot of that, sure. you know, what I, you know, what I find interesting, even, and I like modern art too. And I'm very knowledgeable in art, modern art. I understand it. I know it. I collect it. I've sold it. So we'll see, you'll see some of that in here as well, even though, you know, it might be next to Frederick Remington or Maynard Dixon or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think some galleries are like that. Hopefully, you know, the, there's more of them like that. Some of them are just, you know, they just want to know if it'll sell. And, you know, you know, if you're a good seller, they want it, but they don't care. Okay. But for me, it's always been, well, go on my house. If it doesn't go on my own house, I'm not going in your house. So that's mm -hmm. how I figured it out. Nice. Um. Well, one of my other classmates asked if there's any kind of uh, uh, like a gallery clearinghouse or a gallery website where you can look at multiple galleries as you're in this early process right out of school. How do you go about looking at different galleries? And yeah. Who do you, where do you find finding them? Right. Yeah. 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 There's things like artsy. You know, that's uh, that's one that has a lot of art. It's more what it's more contemporary base you have askart.com that's another one that has lots of galleries on it um you know it's a good question those are two of the biggest ones i think just through google anymore you can just you know put in you know because if they don't even turn up on your search again right like i said you got they better that's have a, true they better have a good website if they're not even showing up on the search eh, maybe they don't want you don't want to show them anyway okay right so you know just do good talk to other artists Mm -hmm. very important because they're going to they'll make recommendations talk to your instructor instructors they may as well but google search artsy ask art um yeah that's what i would do i think just talk to other people but it is hard to know there's not like a, a database really that i can think of that's at least for western arts that sounds like a opportunity mm. <laughs> for me. Uh -huh. there you go it does actually sound like an yeah. opportunity do you network a lot with other galleries? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. So All the you time. know people. Yeah. And, yeah. Everybody in my field. Mm -hmm. Sure. For sure. And, yeah. No. It's, you have to have that. Right. Right. Because, first of all, I deal in old stuff and deceased work as well. And you can't know it all. So you might get something you know is good, but you're not sure exactly. And you need to be able to deal with other gallerists, you know, that know the answer or can help you find the answer. So, and I do that for other galleries too. They get a piece and they don't know if it's Maynard Dixon or they're not sure, you know, I help them and go, yeah, this is what I think. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you better work with other dealers. So networking is. It's important for important. dealers. I'm sure it's yeah. very important for artists too. Yeah. Right. I yeah. tell artists when I'm, you know, taking them on, I say, go talk to the other people that you might know in my gallery, you know, and artists go ask them, see what, mm -hmm. what you know, what their experience has been. Thing. And then sometimes you do shows as well with a All particular artist. So you just clear out a section yep. of, yeah. And yep. Right now we have one for Dennis Minsky. Then we've got one from Josh Gibson, David Mickles coming. Then I have a group show for rodeo. It's all about rodeo. And I invited different artists. Right. This coming come. February? Yeah, yeah. February okay. 3rd. And I've invited different artists that I don't show. So sometimes I'll do shows where I can invite artists that I don't represent, but I respect their work or like their work and want to have them in. And, you know, if they're really good artists, sometimes they can't show, they, they might want to show with me, but they can't, right? Because they're just, the, the galleries, you know, the other, there are other galleries, you know, have them locked in either contractually or, and often they just can't get them enough work, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and it's kind of bad form if you're giving me work and right. they're not getting enough. But so for, for group shows, I'll, I'll invite artists like the rodeo show. I do, do that. So, yeah, no, we do that. We have six, seven shows like plans shows every year, maybe even eight, and then little mini shows here and there of different things. Yep. Nice. Yep. Nice. Good. Um, I think that's, those are all the questions that yeah. I've come up with. I think we covered a lot. Right. Um, unless you have any other suggestions for fresh out of school right. artists. And um, I mean, the, at the, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, it's, it's in visual arts. So, you know, there, there are in our group, there are 
painters and animators right. and you know sculptors and um, a wide range of people. Right. But, um, any advice that you would have uh, for them? Starting? Yeah, it's all the same thing, really, in a weird way. You know, creativity is creativity. You know, whether you're doing digital art, which is a big thing that's happening now, and NFTs and those are going to things that are going to be happening. But it's still you still have the same hurdles. You always, you know, each one has their own hurdles. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're doing, you know, digital art, or if you're doing fine art, or if you're doing, you know, whatever it might be. You know, is do your research. Don't be, you know, one of the things I see artists often do when they first get out, they they just want to shoot for the stars, right? They just want to shoot for the very best gallery they can get, you know, the one that they've read about forever or whatever. And, you know, and they're just not there yet. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's good to start maybe a little more locally, a smaller thing and, you know, get things moving along and selling um, before you approach it. Having said that, sometimes you can, you know, if you're talented enough and you have good enough stuff, you know, reach out to me. But mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't happen often. Right. It really doesn't happen often. You're probably just wasting your own time, their time. And, you know, it's like an actor going, trying to get a role in a movie that's just they not there yet, right? Mm -hmm. They're just going to get, it's going to be a negative experience for them because they'll be like, some gallerists are just like, no. Yeah, no, nah, that's not for me. You know, they won't even say, "Yeah, I like what you're doing." Now it's just like, mm -mm. "Yeah, no, nah, go try somebody." You know, so I mean, I get an artist a day contacts me. Really? Yeah. So wow. it's a, you know, the competition's real. Sure. You know, it's out there. So you know, if you can find somebody who really likes your work, they're local, they're enthusiastic, they can sell it because they are enthusiastic. It doesn't have to be the top tier art gallery you know it can maybe they will be the top tier art gallery sure you know i was i was nothing 20 years ago right literally you know so it takes time so you can build a career with an art gallery too if it's a really good one find a young and up and coming art gallery that's going to be there for a while mm -hmm. and not going out of you know business in 10 years or 20 years and then you grow together and you grow together like sure. my son's in the business with me so you know my business will continue to you know for a long time good, good. <laughs> so i can take young artists and they can you know feel confident it'll still be around in 20 30 years right so right but yeah it's a it, i mean it's a gauntlet of what you have to do there's no doubt about it mm -hmm. and the most important thing as an artist i think is just be as professional as you can in your presentation when you're going to approach a gallery you know and and you know don't show up at august at indian market you know, when they're trying to make their most of their... I've had this happen all the time and when I was in Santa Fe. You know, they show up with their portfolio, you know, on the busiest week of the year and go, I want to show you some stuff. And you're like, no, I yeah. can't see it. Or, right. you know, people show up, you know, somebody showed up today and wanted to show me the work and stuff. And I'm like, you know, send me the... It could be good. It sounds good. I looked at a couple of pictures, but, you know... You, you know, set it up, be professional, okay. you know, it's okay to go and say, this is who I am and whatever, and introduce yourself. And that's fine. And sometimes that can be a really, I had an artist that came in that didn't plan on doing that, Whitney uh, Gardner. And, you know, I was like, this person is very, very competent, extremely good. You know, this is a person I'm interested in. They didn't have an appointment, but they also weren't there to try to sell their work. Mm -hmm. You know, it was me going, oh, you know, let me see what you have. And they're like, and they go, oh, and they had it all ready on their phone. They have a good website, good Instagram. You know, that's why it's, I think, really important to have a good website and good social media in place before you ever go and, you know, start trying to, to find a gallery or sell your work like that. It's very helpful. And you did. You had a good yeah. website with information. But that's critical, I think. So I can, that would be the takeaway of the day, I think. Good. Um, one more question I had yeah. was uh, pricing. Yeah. Do you, um, is there like a discussion with the artist over pricing? Or, I mean, uh, yep. do they come in with? Yes. Usually the biggest problem is they come in with prices that are too low. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And you help them out with that. I go, this is too low. Uh huh. How can I put your painting on that wall if it's five hundred dollars, and everyone else is five thousand dollars or whatever? Because 
you know, the wall space is expensive. It's not that you're you're underestimating the value of your work already off the bat. Yeah. And if Which you I think we all do. Yeah. And if you, because you want to make sales or you need to make sales, I understand that. Some people need to eat, right? Or we just don't know. Yeah, or you don't know. Uh, and you think, oh, I'll make it low, just like your reaction. Oh, it's too low? Uh, you would think it would be just the opposite. But um, the problem is if it's too low is also if you're going to sell all this work at 500 700 bucks, right? Well, what happens in 10 years when you're, you know, it's worth $5,000? i will tell you what happens. All those pieces you sold at 250 and 500 come out of the market, and now you're competing against your old stuff that you sold too, right? Because, you know, a lot of people go, oh, it's worth 5000 now. I paid 500 bucks. I think I'll make sell this. Mm -hmm. I'll make 4500 you know, and you're competing against the things you produce right at the, or they may go, mm, I'll just sell it for 2,500. I'm happy with that. And now you're cutting into your sales sure. too, right? Oh, there's one for 2,500 bucks. I'll buy that instead of yours that just came out for 5,000. So you're much better off to try to start with the right price structure and a dealer should be able to help you okay. with that, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, with, as a bronze artist, there are certain parameters that you just have fixed cost. And, right. you know, you go, you have to go, this is my fixed cost. And that's not going away or may go up, probably will. So it has to be of a certain of number of value just so I can get my fixed cost back plus profit. It can't be just like the dealer's making all the money and I'm making literally the dealer not and too the much. Foundry. And the foundry, yeah. right? <laughs> so, you, you know, it's important to get that price structure set to begin with and not too low. Honestly, you want it appropriate for the abilities you have and what you're doing. If you if you can't, and that for a frame, for an artist who's a painter, that means using good frames. It's a big problem I see. Lovely painting, terrible frame. Hmm. You know, they put it, and that just says everything you want to know about them, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, that's a beautiful painting, but the frame, they don't even care. You know, it's a garbage frame. To, you know, are they going to get past that? So I usually have a discussion right off the bat especially if it's a younger artist, like you, you got to, we got to do something with your frames. You know, you need a, you've got great paintings, terrible frames. We need to make a frame that is maybe your own frame. And it's going to be hard at first, possibly because, you know, it is expense and you're going to be covering that expense, mm -hmm. but it also allows you to price your paintings higher, sets the tone of who you are and what you are. So spend the money on those kind of components you know, I'm sure the same thing for the bronze. Make a little tag for the bronze, you know. Make it where it can swivel around, you know. That's nice, too. Those mm -hmm. kind of things. How yeah. about stone base versus no base? I mean, uh, you know, it's a mixed bag, you know. I've got a bronze right now I'm dealing with because it's got a chip in the, bron in the base, you know. And it's going to screw the whole thing up and take me a long time. I wish it didn't have that nice black marble. But, you know, the artists, that's how they want to do it, and that's okay. But that can be a problem. It may come be a problem to you, too, because you rise and there's a little chip in the thing, and they're like, mm, got a chip. I need a new one. Oh, that's 200 bucks. Right. Right. Oh, came back. Another chip. Do um, do buyers, I mean, do, do they care about a marble base versus no mm, base? No, or? most don't, I don't no? think. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I don't. You know, some are, and it's just heavier. Costs more to ship, yep. You know, has breakage, and so in a lot of ways, it's just problematic. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Okay. There you go. All those things you would have never known about. Right. Yep. Right. You know, I hear about some people spending more on the the base than they do on the foundry expense. Yeah, that's right. Piece. Without it, so I would start without them. Okay. You know, and if, but that's good. Yeah, and if they come back to you and go, if the dealers come back and go, yeah, and you know, they want a base, I can't imagine. No, I wouldn't use it. I think it's just an extra expense and, okay. you know, and then also they, you get it and they like it and they go, yeah, but they don't like the base. Right. Or it's not the right color. Or if you have different colors of granite or whatever, yeah, I want that one. Right. Well, we can't get that one anymore. Eh, I'm not interested. You know, so. Yeah. I had one that went to a corporate retreat in Colorado and they said, well, we don't want the base. So I, I went out and I got a hammer. <laughs> and broke it off. <laughs> I broke the base off and shipped it that way. Yeah. I was like, well, I wish I hadn't done this. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. That'll be your takeaway. Yeah. That'll that'll be worth your effort to come in here because you won't there you maybe go. put bases on. <laughs> so, but if you don't ask yeah. these questions before you, you know, I think that's another important thing for artists, 
you know, to be able to have some way to ask these questions to dealers and give them the real scoop of what's going on. Right. right? And again, that's why I was willing to do this. I wanted to do this, not even willing. I wanted to do it because yeah. I'm hoping artists can listen to this component of the, of the thing and go, okay, these are some of the issues I have too. And at least I have a sense of maybe what I'm getting myself into with art galleries. Again, I can only speak to how I do it, what I sure. do it. Sure. Other galleries are different, but yeah. you know, you'd have to talk to other galleries to get their scoop. Yeah. But they might not want to give it to you. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, you've been very open. I really appreciate yeah. this opportunity sure. to ask these questions. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I've, I've had you on my list for two years. My mother in law <laughs> always brings us into your gallery. Uh, yeah. And, I've seen you and, before, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I finally, I mentioned to my mentor uh, at school that I said, well, you know, I should really send this email. And she said, you're doing it today. <laughs> and so I did. You got back to me in an hour. Yeah. Which was great. So, and yep. I think in two hours we had this, this yep. podcast lined up. Yep. So um, yep. she's like, I told you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully she'll like the, the, the uh, podcast. Yeah. Hopefully. Make it required <laughs> listening <laughs> right. to all, at least the last half part, they'll really yeah. You know, I think those are yeah. questions that people need to know. They, they, yeah. they all, you know, all artists have these questions, and they can't know the answer and, until they get out there, unless they can get dealers to, you know, give them the true scoop. Right. You know, it's, and it's a very competitive world. Yeah. You know, and you got to be careful on the gallery that you pick because, you know, they can uh, take advantage of you. They're in a position of power. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. know, you just have to run the gauntlet. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, another question that somebody asked was, what what things do we need to look out for with galleries? And I think you've addressed several of those. Yeah, really talk to other artists, so, they'll yeah. tell you. Yeah, that's great. You Google that's them, great. too, and see what kind of re reviews and things they have, too. Mm -hmm. Usually the biggest problem with the gar art galleries, they don't pay you on time, or sometimes they will never pay you. Really? It does happen. Yeah, if you get a gallery, they just go bust or whatever, they can't make it. You know, they're going to still sell your stuff, but they may not pay you. Wow. Almost, there's lots of art artists out there go, yep, I lost a bunch. They sold it and they went bankrupt. Wow. You know, I didn't get paid. Get And also, make sure that you, when you drop off your artwork, that there's something that's signed for Receipt. every piece. Oh, I never got that. You know, I sent it. And, well, where's the paperwork? Yeah. You know. Well, that's good to know. So, and if you're picking up pieces, they, they sign off and all this stuff. Yeah, good records. If they don't have good records, mm, that's probably a red flag. Sure. You know, oh, we don't need a paperwork. Yeah, just drop just it off. Just a handshake, right? Yeah, drop it off. <laughs> Handshake's <laughs> fine. But when you actually are leaving the material, mm -hmm. you need more than, you need a signature that says that we have that object that we're responsible for. What if it burns down? Right. I know a gallerist, this, this gallery got blown up. Blew up with a methane gas thing. Wow. You know, if you don't have records, you know, how do you get that money back from the insurance and all that? Well, that brings up another point. Who, I, I suppose I would need to make sure a gallery has insurance for my work on their site. Yeah, that when, what's it, when it's in the gallery, yes, you should make sure that they yeah. do. Yeah. I don't know if I, I think it, well, and the consignment, our confi consignment forms have that. Okay. It says you're insured, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So yes, it should say something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, who's responsible? Right. Is it my insurance company or yep. theirs? And... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Good. All right, John. Great. Well, thank you so yes, much. Yes, I enjoyed it. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, let, we'll let you go out and look at art. And, Absolutely. Yeah, because I kind of snagged you, and we, right. I'm glad we were right. able to do this, and hopefully it was helpful. Yeah, definitely. Very I, helpful. I, and I look forward to seeing your art. Good. I do. Keep me in the loop. I will. I'm very serious about that. I will keep that. you posted yeah. as, it, as it develops. This yeah. first year is a lot of experimentation. I'm and, sure. And uh, kind of setting the stage for next year. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. It's a lot of fun. Very Great. good. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right.